Through its research and convenings, the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy seeks to make philanthropy more impactful today and to create a smarter, stronger sector for tomorrow. It's great to see you all this afternoon. Um, and welcome. Um, I'm, for, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Fred Alley, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Weingart Foundation, and um, I'm also the Chair of the Center of Philanthropy and Public Policy's Board of Advisors. And it's something I dearly treasure. It's a, it's a, it, this, the work of the Center is just fabulous, as I know many of you uh, understand. Um, I know we're all looking forward to, um, to our discussion today, and Joel, welcome. Um, I, it's so great to have you, uh, have you here again, I think for the third time, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but let me start off by talking a little bit about, about the center. Um, the center for um, nearly two decades now has worked to promote effective philanthropy and strengthen the nonprofit sector. The center does this research um, does this through research that informs philanthropic decision making and public policy, all with the goal of advancing community problem solving. And as I think you all will agree, especially those of us in th Southern California, that we understand with so many tough issues like homelessness, affordability, displacement, growing economic in inequality, attacks on our immigrant communities, and so many other things, advancing effective community problem solving has become more important than ever before. And, um, and, and this is the work of, of, of the center, and they do such a good job with that. Thanks to the leadership and support of the Center's Board of Advisors and philanthropic partners, the Center has become a premier venue for high-level dis high discourse on philanthropy and public policy, and especially I always like to point out the role of public-private partnerships. One of the many things that sense, sets the Center apart is its focus on producing research and reports that are both useful and usable, uh, and usable for the foundation for foundation executives and trustees, individual donors and their families, and other leading practitioners in the field. I'm, for example, reminded of the work um, of the center's great work on strategic partnership offices in local, state, and federal government. This is work that is still referred to on a regular basis throughout this country, and it's just an example of the center's great research that is also actionable for those of us uh, who work in the field on a day-in and day-out basis. The center has also, as you all well know, become an important convener of leaders in philanthropy and the community, attracting, attracting some of the most notable voices in philanthropy to participate in our various programs from our national leadership forums to our distinguished speaker series, and like today, our conversations on philanthropy. And as I mentioned earlier, we are lucky enough to have some of a, some uh, notable individuals in our field come and join us more than once. And once again, Joel joins us for the third time, and I hope you'll come back many more times as well, Joel. Um, uh, to give you... Um, uh, some uh, advance notice on somebody who's going to be joining us in April, uh, Pam Norley, the pr president of Fidelity Charitable, uh, which some of you might know is second only in grant making to Gates in this country, uh, is going to be joining us for another conversation in philanthropy. So, so something, again, we can all look forward to. This past year, the center added new efforts, including something that is really near and dear to my heart, the, we launched the, um, the Irene Hirano Inouye Philanthropic Leadership Fund. And this is a fund that elevates and amplifies the role of uh, philanthropic leadership, and especially with a focus on the relationship between the board and, um, and, and the executive, uh, the shared governance between uh, foundation boards and CEOs, which hasn't received enough attention in our field, and this is going to be the work of, 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 of the new fund. Um, 
we've already uh, seen uh, uh, the first case and, uh, 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 that came out of the funds, the, the, uh, the funds work. This was, uh, this was released in 2017. Many of you, of you are familiar with it. Um, it's um, the catalytic role that philanthropy played in Detroit's grand bargain. And uh, currently the center is also working um, on a uh, look at homelessness, uh, examining the recent efforts in Los Angeles to, to end homelessness. So another example of the, of the, of the work of the fund. Um, as we near our 20th anniversary, and it's, it's hard to believe, it's 20 years, uh, it's coming right up. Um, I want to express, uh, as always, our deep gratitude uh, to the Dean of the Sol Price School of Public Policy, Jack Knott. Jack, there you are. Thank you, as always, for the great support. Jack has encouraged and supported the work of the center for many years, so we're all appreciative of that. It's, I also want to thank um, um, the, uh, the efforts of um, so many other people's, people who work uh, in support of the center, and in particular, I want to ask our philanthropic partners that might be here today, if you would stand up, please, and be recognized, because we couldn't do this work without you, as well as the members of the Board of Advisors. So if you're here, please, thank, please stand up, and uh, thank you very, very much for your efforts. And finally, I want to especially thank Mike, Michael and Jane Eisner uh, for their sponsorship of their lesson, of, the, of, our, uh, of our luncheon today. Um, their support, along with efforts from Trent Stamp, my colleague from the Eisner Foundation, who I caught just with a mouthful of food. Uh, I want to I recognize you, Trent, as well, for helping to bring this, bring this all together. And finally, thank you to the Golden Sachs Philanthropy Fund and the Jewish Community Foundation. I think I saw Marv over here somewhere uh, of Los Angeles who provided additional support today. So uh, I now want to turn this over to Kara uh, Esposito, my colleague, uh, the director of the Leonetti O'Connell Family Foundation, uh, a longtime philanthropic partner of the center, um, a good colleague of mine, I was, I was so pleased uh, a couple weeks ago to go in um, uh, to Professor Esposito's class and do a guest lecture. And uh, so, Kara, come on up and join us. So Fred's lecture was so amazing and so riveting that my students didn't even ask for a break. It was amazing. So thank you, Fred, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here today. As Fred shared, I've been involved with the center for many years as a philanthropic partner, and it all started on the first day of classes at USC almost 12 years ago, I almost can't believe that, when I plopped down in Professor Ferris's office, introduced myself, and I said, I know you don't know me from Adam, I used to be a litigator, I'm now in this sector, and I don't have the foggiest idea what I'm doing, please, 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 will you help me? And that began what has been an absolutely transformative relationship for me. I cannot express how deeply the center has informed our work at the foundation. I have learned to be intentional, impactful, and strategic. The center's mission is to promote more effective philanthropy and strengthen the, through research that, that assists philanthropic decision making. Most important, I think, it helps all of us to think differently about how we might achieve innovative solutions to our most critical problems. I'd like to share a little bit about an essential support group of the center. It's called the Director's Circle, and it is engaging in new and exciting efforts to support donors and their families. The circle started with a philanthropic book club many years ago, which brought together a small group of donors and members of giving families to discuss some of the opportunities and challenges inherent in family philanthropy. Because as we all know, if you've seen one family foundation, you've seen one family foundation. <laughs> Through carefully selected readings and very, very frank discussions, the members of the book group came together and to better understand the issues and concerns that donors and their families face, ranging from complex family dynamics to more technical issues like identifying effective vehicles for giving. As word about the book group spread and others wanted to join, the center decided to expand it and launch it into a luncheon series, 
where members could hear directly from national experts in the field and continue conversations with their peers about how to achieve more meaningful and impactful giving. As the Spenner expanded pro programming around family philanthropy, we realized it, that there was just an enormous demand for this type of knowledge and network. And last year, in response, the center hosted the inaugural Family Philanthropy Forum entitled Donors and Their Families, Enduring Issues, Emerging Themes, and Endless Possibilities. The event hosted over 100 donors with speakers from some of the nation's most prominent philanthropic families and included workshops with leading experts and educators in the field. The director's circle shapes the center's work with donors and their families. It's an intimate group of philanthropic leaders who seek to grow the meaning and power of their giving. They are informed by the center's research, inspired by their peers, and connected to leading experts through their relationships with the center. I would like very much to thank my colleagues in this group for their valuable insights and important contributions to our donor education efforts. Could members of the director's circle please stand and be acknowledged? Mom. And Marie's here, and I, there's a couple others. Anyway, if this work speaks to you, please consider joining us as a philanthropic partner or member of the director's circle as we strive to create a more knowledgeable, thoughtful group of philanthropic leaders and donors who are committed to building a better future. Thank you. So I, I just want to take a minute and introduce um, our next speaker, um, who actually in this room deserves uh, doesn't require much of an introduction. I'm talking about, about Michael Eisner, the co-founder of the, of the Eisner Foundation, and uh, a longtime friend of the center, and a, a longtime friend of our, our featured speaker today, Joel Fleischman. And I was, Michael, I was just asking Trent how the two of you know each other, and then I was reminded, well, Joel's connected to probably everyone. Uh, in, in, you know that uh, that, that I that I can think of. So um, so anyway, without any further ado, Michael, would you uh, would you join me on stage and um, introduce uh, Joel for us? Thank you. So it's true. I have known Joel quite a long time. As you know, Joel is the professor of law and public policy at the Sanford School at Duke, but. I met Joel when Disney was trying to figure out how to do uh, a teacher program at Disney, a teacher award program. But then I remembered that I had been reading Vanity Fair for years, and there was this amazing writer writing about wine, which I knew nothing about. But the writing was so interesting that I got to know Joel through Vanity Fair. Then, like every father, I learned that he was involved with Duke. Thought, well, I better really get to know him. <laughs> Unfortunately, Duke doesn't have a hockey team. So even though I wanted all of my three children to go to Duke, no hockey, no Duke. So that was rough. Uh, and then over the years, I have realized, like the book Being There by Jersey Kaczynski, there was a person in America that everybody knew. Everybody knew through God knows how. But if you'd mention the South, oh, do you know Joel? If you'd mention Carolina, do you know Joel? If you mentioned the University of North Carolina, if you mentioned March Madness, if you mentioned getting into Duke, or for that, everybody knew Joel. So, that was pretty impressive. But the most impressive thing was I found myself in France with my mother and my wife. I'm not sure whether we had a child with us. And we went on a wine tasting trip with Joel. And to this day, I'm amazed about what he knew. But what was most impressive to me is when I was dating my wife 55 years ago, we went to a restaurant near Mount Sinai Hospital where you had to bring your own wine, which we didn't do. And the waitress said, well, somebody left their wine here, and there's a half a bottle, and you can take it. 
So he took the wine. I'm not a wine drinker. I'm not really a drinker. I loved it. And it was called Lynch Baj. I had no idea where it was or what it was about. I'm in France with Joel, and he said, you know, we could have dinner with these people called Kaz, and they happen to be the proprietors, the owner of a winery. And I said, oh, great. He said, you know, it's called Lynch Baj. You probably never heard of it. So that was fortuitous, and I knew forever Joel and I would be friends. Um, Joel did something else. We started a, uh, our own family, not my parents or my grandparents' foundation, and we needed somebody who knew something about this. And Joel introduced us to Trent uh, Stamp, who has run our foundation amazingly well. Please, nobody talk to him. We don't want you to steal him away. There are a lot of people here that would want him. He is fantastic. And again, Joel Fleischman's fingers are into every pie in my life, which didn't end until last night. And it didn't even end. It just continued. Because as you know, Joel has written two books. Uh, but the, the book that he's going to talk about, which is Putting Wealth to Work, I got yesterday, figured I'd get myself prepared, and then I couldn't stop reading it. Because in reading it, it looked as though everything we had done was wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's really about spending down your foundation while you're alive, and of course, I've done the opposite. Uh, but there was a lot of discussions in there about how the opposite is also a, I'm sure Joel will talk a little bit about that, is a worthy thing to do. But when I got to the part about do you spend it down, are your children attentive, are you, do your children care, will you be changing the direction, are you allowed to change the direction? And there were two words in it that are, have been driving me crazy since I read this. Donor remorse, that was the first. I've heard of buyer's remorse, I've heard of you know, dating remorse. I've heard of sports remorse. Donors remorse, I hadn't heard of. And I realized that when you start a foundation, what you thought was the right way to go and the right organizations to support, some of which were great, some of which were corrupt, later you, as you mature and as your foundation matures, you learn and you have what I never knew how to describe, which I now will use all the time, donor's remorse. But then the second word was donor descendant remorse. Now that really is a killer, because now you're doing this, you know, this uh, foundation that you want your children to appreciate and, and uh, get into, and you're now gone, and they're sitting, I imagine them sitting around a table and said, who thought up this idea to help this, this uh, pediatric camp that is long since closed? Must be my stupid father. So I now understand donor remorse, donor descendant remorse, and Jane and I are rethinking our entire life. <laughs> so, uh, that's my relationship with Joel. It continues through his writing, and I'm sure it will continue through his next books as well. So I would like to introduce now, uh, obviously, uh, Jim Ferris, who you know, who is going to conduct an interview with Joel. And you know he's the director of the Center of Philanthropy and Public Policy, as we discussed. So we look forward to Joel and Mr. Ferris. Thank you. You know, on Saturday Night Live, they keep count of how many people have hosted it. And Joel is sort of the winner for the center, having appeared three times. And each time he's come to the center, he's talked about a new book. So the first book was the American, or the foundation, America's Best Kept Secret, um, which talks about foundations and how they operate and what they do. The second one is called Give Smart, which he wrote along with his colleague at Bridgespan. And it's like an instant classic. It's what I give every donor I meet if they're trying to figure out how to do their giving. Um, 
It's basically six questions to ask yourself, and anybody should be able to answer them. And Michael, there's no wrong answer. It just helps to guide and shape you. Um, and then the third book is the current one, which is Putting Wealth to Work, which is quite fascinating. Um, it's broken down into three parts. The first part talks about what's happened in philanthropy over the last 30 years. And philanthropy, um, the commentators and critics of philanthropy usually know the last five years. But very few people understand sort of the evolution over three decades or more. And Joel is one of the few people that can bring that perspective. So we're going to talk a little bit about that perspective. Um, and then he spends the last two thirds talking about this issue of should foundations exist in perpetuity or should they have limited lives, which he thinks is sort of the sort of the pivotal question facing philanthropy going forward. So that's where we're going to go. Do you want to sort of offer any comments as we get going? Well, I do want to offer thanks to you sure. for organizing this event and to your board. Uh, I want to say that, that I've known for quite some time um, how well you're doing. But as I listened to, the, uh, to Fred's description of the um, of the center. Uh, I keep track of things that are going on like this around the country. And I have to say that I don't know anyone that is doing it better in terms of working with the local communities, in terms of working actively with, with philanthropists who are trying to figure out what to do uh, and engaging them in the, in the work of the center. So I, my, my hat, which I don't have on now, is off to you. And if I had several hats, I'd take them all off to you for, for because I think that what you're doing is something that's, uh, that's pace setting in the world of philanthropy, particularly uh, university involvement in philanthropy. I don't think anybody's doing it better than you're doing it. And, and my sense is that, uh, that others could learn from you what, from that. So I thank you for, for, the, for the example that you've set in, in creating the center. I, I'd forgotten that you graduated from Chapel Hill. Go Hills. <laughs> what is, it's not known, and it's, a, it's kept a secret at Duke that I graduated from Chapel Hill. <laughs> so so there's, there's a kinship there. And so now the people who, who know me since know that I'm involved with Duke, but I don't have any degrees from Duke. My degrees are all from Chapel Hill and Yale. So uh, Trent, you won't tell anybody. <laughs> um, in any event, the, I just want to kick off by saying that the reason that that first part of the book is there is to give people a context in, for the rest of the book. That is, the sense of showing how much philanthropy has changed over the past 25 years, really starting. You know, when you think about the fact that, that uh, through the whole 20th century, um, there were only a handful, literally a handful, of foundations that, were, that purposefully sent, spent themselves down. And the, na the names are some of them you will know about, the, the, the Julius Rosenwald Foundation, um, the um, Aaron Diamond Foundation, um, the, the um, John Olin Foundation, but I've just enumerated <laughs> all of the most significant foundations that spent down in the whole 20th century. And then all of a sudden, starting in about 1990, we began to hear from foundations like the Gates Foundation, a number of the high-tech donors foundations all of which were dis uh, introduced to the world as being spend down foundations. People deciding they're gonna give while living or creating a foundation that's gonna go out of business uh, in a limited period of time. And so I decided that it was really important to try to examine why this was happening and what the consequences of it might be for the nonprofit sector. Um, you know, it's, it's not, I think, appreciated that virtually all of the major nonprofit organizations in the United States were, were founded by, guess what? Perpetual foundations. You look at the, the whole array of environmental organizations, they're all, they're, uh, the Nat, NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, Ford Foundation, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, Ford Foundation's second year of, of its existence. It was created by other foundations, Human Rights Watch, um, 
all of those organizations, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, all of the ethnic organizations, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, Native American Legal Defense Fund, all of these organizations and many others were started by perpetual foundations. They were not started by foundations or even sustained very much by foundations that are spending down. And so you have to ask, and why is that the case? Why is it, why, what, what, what is this role, the peculiar role that the, that the, the perpetual foundations play? They play the role of being the, the, the nation's um, chief uh, social capital bank for all practical purposes. And they're not in it because they want immediate returns. They, they're in it because they sense a good idea that may have returns over a long period of time. You think about the fact that, that, the, that the foundation, that the Ford and other foundations that supported the environmental movement, those, are, those movements matured very over 20, 30 years. Ford, NRDC was founded in 1967 with a grant from the Ford Foundation to four graduates of the Yale Law School. Uh, and it, and, but now, how many years is it since 1967? 40 some years, 50 years? 50. 50 years, it now has a million and a half paid, paid members of NRDC. The same is true of the Environmental Defense Fund. But Ford has been nurturing it all along from the beginning. And that's the way perpetual foundations do because they are perpetual. Because they're around, they can generate income, and they can continue uh, putting, let's say, water and fertilizer on the organizations that they help create. You ask yourself this question, why is the nonprofit sector so vigorous and so, and so varied, so dynamic, so diverse? It's because there's always been that social capital provided by these perpetual foundations, not the spend down foundations. It's a character, you know, you ask yourself the question, why is that the case? It's largely because of the fact that many of the, of the creators of the spend down foundations want instant impact. They're trying to, in a sense, psychologically relive in the, in the social sector what they in, magnificently lived in the for-profit sector. And the problem is that impact, real impact does not come very fast in the social sector. If you're doing anything enduring, it takes a long time for it to mature. But when it does mature, you know, so you look at the, at the nonprofit sector in the United States, and you're looking at a sector that is the envy of the world, major contributor. You think of all the things that nonprofit organizations still do. Half the hospital beds in the United States are nonprofit hospital beds. A quarter of the, of the kids going to, going to college are in private colleges. Um, and, the, and, and think tanks and scientific research. All of those things are largely supported by nonprofit organizations. And those are very important to the dynamism of American society, it seems to me. And so when you think about the role of perpetual, so carry the narrative even further. I, don't, I should, probably shouldn't go on this long. Go right? ahead. The, <laughs> that, one more point. Uh, when you, when, the reason I ended up writing the book was because I came to the conclusion after looking at the evidence, there was a growing movement against the creation of perpetual foundations. It was really not so much a movement for spending down, although there were some people who were interested in spending down. Chuck Feeney, the founder of Atlantic Philanthropies, where I worked for 10 years, was articulate, passionate about the, 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 the urgency of the now, the problems that exist, and he, and he decided to spend down Atlantic Philanthropies, which at its peak had $8 billion, and now is left, I think, in the, the closing in 2019, left with, they've made, the, they've committed all the money. There's no more money to commit at this point. Um, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is, the, you look at, so there are some, many people who are spending down are doing it for what I regard as, as very persuasive, legitimate reasons. The, I urge them in the book to be cautious about how they go about doing it, because not everything that appeals to people is a way of solving the problem, and in, especially in a short period of time. Because difficult problems can't be solved in, in a short period of time. It takes iterative attention to it, cause and eff, uh, error, errors making and correcting for them. But, the, but a lot of the, of the people around the, the Philanthropy Roundtable, which is, a, which is a group of primarily conservative foundations and, found, and donors, came to the conclusion that it was, that, that that perpetual foundations 
by definition are liberal, and that, that persons, that donors who die are gonna, will know that their foundations are gonna wander away, drift away uh, from what they wanted to do. And they, so they, they basically, and they're open about it. I, I, like, I like a lot of the stuff that the Philanthropy Roundtable does, but what I don't like is the notion that, 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 that perpetual foundations are bad because they're going, to, they're going to drift away from donor intent and they're going to, and they're going to um, go left when they do so. And I, part of this book was to examine the record of, of many of the perpetual foundations, and I cannot find one single major foundation that in fact has drifted away from donor intent, and uh, since they weren't there, they, the, the, reason they, the, the reason if they're left, they're left because that's what the donor wanted to do. The donor wanted to do things, that, and, and, and they've been highly faithful to what the donors wanted to do. So that's the reason I wrote the book. It, is, it, is, it was in a sense trying to correct what I saw was a misperception. And if you read the book, there's a whole chapter. A lot of that movement was built on Henry Ford II's uh, decision to, to depart from the board of the Ford Foundation. And there's a whole chapter in the book about why it's, th that's basically a figment of their imagination. That's not, a, that, when you, the, and, the, and I'll just sum it up by saying, Henry Ford II served on the board of the Ford Foundation for 40 years. He was, he was a trustee, he was president of the foundation, he was chairman of the foundation, he, 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 he appointed the committee that wrote the mission for the Ford Foundation, and he, and he finally, when he left, he praised the foundation for having done wonderful things. He's the only member of the family that served on the board. There was never any articulation of donor intent at all. He embodied the donor intent. And what he did during the period of time there, built the Ford Foundation. So the notion that, that, it's, that, it's, that it's the poster child for, for departure from donor intent is sheer fiction. It's, it's logically impossible. So in any event, the, the microphone is now passed to you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, so you say that some of the impetus for this sort of limited life is greater impact, something like uh, the Diamond Foundation, where right. they, they sort of put a lot of resources into finding um, medicine for AIDS. The right? cocktail, they, they invented, right. the, their money invented the cocktail cure for AIDS. So you just want to focus treatment. in on solving a problem that needs to be solved now. Right. Um, whereas w some people worry about donor intent, and so therefore they sort of keep the life of the foundation short so it doesn't drift away. Mm -hmm. um, if you were advising a foundation to think about the structure of their giving, whether it's a foundation, what are the principles you would ask them or suggest that they reflect upon as they sort of set up their foundation? Well, you know, uh, I would, uh, of course, I would go back to Give Smart. Yeah. And the first, the first question that we ask in Give Smart is, what do you really care about? What kinds of things do you really, in your heart, want to do something about to leave the world a better place? Um, and, and that is something that I still, uh, still hold. So I would ask, say, ask yourself the question, what do you really care about? The second th the question I would say is, it's not necessarily from the book there, it is that what, what, do you, what, kind of, what do you really care about that you think you can do something about with the amount of money that you've got to deploy over, and over what period of time you would like to deploy it. So you have to ask yourself the question, what's practical? Um, because there's no, you, you're not gonna solve global warming with a modest amount of money. And you're not gonna solve global warming over a, 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 over a limited number of years. So if you, whatever you care about has to be something, and the, the enough to do something about it is, you have to fit it into the, your time frame, the amount of money you've got to spend, and what you really care about. And I think that's, that, that's what I would, and, and friends of mine who have talked to me, in some cases, people from foundations have called and asked me the, the same question, and I've said the same thing to them. So what about um, this trend to do the for donors to do their giving outside of a foundation through an LLC? Um, it's not new, although people think it started with uh, Zuckerberg and Chan. Yeah. Um, but what about the sort of, the array of options for doing giving other than the private foundation? Well, the, we, the, good, the best example of that is the example of, um, 
uh, Piero Midyar, who created a foundation, and then after two or three years said, it's too much of a straitjacket for me. I want to do things that are harder to do for a foundation than they would be if I were giving my own money to it. And so he did create the foundation, but then he proceeded to create the Omidyar Network, which basically, where he would, through which he deployed uh, non-tax benefited dollars, basically, to invest into for, for-profit corporations. Perpet- foundations can, in fact, do that, but it's harder. It's much harder to do it. You do it through donor, you know, to, to a variety. They've been a, the instruments by which foundations have been able to work with for-profit corporations in achieving social good. Bottom, you know, one uh, uh, double bottom line, triple bottom line, getting your, getting your capital back, interest on it, and also achieving social good. And he, so he's been able to do that with a multiple, a multiple array of, ve- of vehicles. Uh, I think that uh, and when, when uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Dr. Chan announced their gift, and uh, they announced they were creating an LLC, a number of reporters from abroad called me up and said, you know, this sounds like it's not a good deal. It's a, not a good thing to do. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, the fact of the matter is it's basically setting aside a certain amount of money and saying, I want to spend it for philanthropic purposes, but there's no taxable event occurring. It's, the money is if you kept it in your own bank account for all practical purposes, but you have a presumption that you're going to d- use it for so- to achieving social good in a variety of different ways. So you, mul- and you think about donor-advised funds as, a, as another development in the field. It's a, it's a, very, good in, a very good development because it enables people to, put, to set money aside for, for, for beneficial charitable purposes when they've got money that they would like to, that's surplus. A- Andrew Carnegie talked about spending your surplus dollars, most people don't, uh, don't, don't choose to d- decide what's surplus and what isn't. But in any event, if you, if, you, if, you, if you know enough about what you want to do and you feel like you've got surplus dollars, donor advised funds are a great vehicle for letting you give it to the, the, give it to, uh, the fund host and, let, and get a tax deduction for doing it and then taking your time to figure out what you want to do with it to, to achieve the good that you want to achieve. So. When I look at the array of, of, of options that are there, uh, I think that the, I, 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 no one admires the work of foundations more than I do. But on the other hand, they, they can't do everything. And for, depending on what donors want to do, they want flexibility. They want to achieve impact. Uh, there are many different ways of doing it. I think about the foundation founders, for example, um, who, have, who feel this very, very strongly. Uh, you, you, you've got... Um, Julian Robertson, for example, started a foundation, uh, the Robertson Foundation, but he wanted, he, he felt that you couldn't solve the environmental problems that he cared about by just, by, by with a foundation because it has to be very care, careful. It can't, can't, can't lobby for all practical purposes. It can't get involved in camp, political campaigns at all. Um, and so he, set, so he he structured the foundation so that the president of the foundation is not paid by the foundation money. It's paid by his money, his, his, his dollars that are not tax benefited. Personal, personal wealth. So any donor, any foundation with a living donor can do that. They can, and, and, and the consequence is his foundation president can lobby or they can, or they can create a 501c4 and make political contributions if the, if the donor is alive. It's an easy thing to do and you get a, sort of an integrated strategy with the foundation doing the things that it can do legally and with the, and with the non-tax benefited dollars doing the things that it, that it can do because it's, it doesn't have the same kinds of restrictions on it. The idea of creating a, a suite of, of vehicles is a really good thing to do. Uh, and so, you know, I, it, it, I, the, the postscript in this book, as you'll see when you get to it, if you, when you read it, um, says if, you, if you're looking for immediate impact uh, and, you, and you care about and whatever you care about, you can, you can probably achieve it much more rapidly than you could in, in trying to deploy the money with a foundation philanthropically if it's a difficult problem because you've got the option of, if, of using your own money and putting it into, into supporting candidates who, who feel about issues the way you do, essentially. So there, it's a long winded way of saying there are many advantages to the multiple vehicle situation and I think they're all beneficial. So I, how do you feel about the future of foundations? 
Are you worried that sort of this trend towards limited life foundations might weaken the role that foundations can play in society? I mean, I, yeah. I sort of detected yes. a bit of that. Can you yeah. explain that or talk about that a little yeah, bit Yeah, no, more? that's the reason. I, that's really the fundamental reason that I chose to write the book is I think that the, that the people who are so zealous about spending down uh, tend to, uh, to, to derogate the contribution of the, of the perpetual foundations. I think, that, and I began to worry that if this movement really caught on and people didn't create perpetual foundations, where would the money come from to start new nonprofit organizations? Because that's not the kind of thing that people who are spending down typically want to support. And therefore, I wrote the book because I believe very strongly in the value of perpetual foundations for a lot of reasons. It's not just that reason. It is the fact that you know you think about a group, a, a, a pool of money, with 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 uh, in, intelligent board directors of the foundations spending a number of years trying to figure out what to do things. The Green Revolution did not happen in a day. The Green Revolution, which is the only found, one of the two things for which a foundation has gotten a Nobel Prize for all practical purposes, it took some 35 to 40 years for them to get from the point of, 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 of Borlaug coming up with the idea of creating um, uh, new sci folk, hiring scientists and focusing them on the development of new food grains until you actually got the food grains. And so but when they got it, it was 35 to 40 years later. And, and that development ended up, according to the demographers, in saving the lives of about a billion and a half people in the world. But it took a long time to do it. And so you, and that, my point is, you think about the people in the perpetual foundations as being a, a, one of the most important things they do is to develop ideas. It's like a, an informal think tank. And they, become, and they become specialists in the, in, the, in the subject matter areas that they care about and that their directors want them to focus on. You can't do that ad hoc because, you, and, and when you think about, there are 100, about 100,000 100, um, private foundations in the United States. Not all of them do it that way. The biggest foundations, the 100 or so that have, that have a billion dollars in money and are staffed can in fact do that. And not many institutions that play, can play that multiple purpose, not only of giving money to other people, but of maintaining a staff that thinks about how to solve a problem over the long run and be willing to try something. And then if it fails, they can try something else and they and basically fine tune their solutions. It's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary, so I, I think it can do a lot of things that setting up ad hoc organizations can't. And that's a very important thing for society. Okay. Um, we're going to take questions in a moment, but before we do, I thought we'd do a lightning round um, with some of the sort of emerging trends over the last 30 years. And, and what I want to do is sort of give you the concept, and you tell me if it's a winner, a loser, or still in progress. Okay. Okay? Um, sure. Uh, it's, I'm trying out a new career, Jack. Um, uh, Capacity building. Capacity building is definitely a winner. It's been very slow to take off, but it is taking off gradually. Capacity building is, in a sense, giving nonprofit organizations the kind of, of, of support that will enable them to develop the capacity to be effective uh, and do their jobs uh, as, as economically as possible and pay attention to what the impact they're achieving. Metrics. Metrics are also very important, and metric, where they where they can't, you know, not uh, the, the, uh, I, I, it's, for a long time they attributed the, the quotation to to Einstein, but I've recently read that he didn't invent the notion that not you know not everything counts that can be counted or something like that. You, uh, what is what am I trying yeah, to say? Yeah, uh, what what's important <laughs> can't always be measured. Basically. Well, some, well, okay, that's a, a version of it. A version, yeah. a version of it. Yeah. So metrics. But the, but the important thing is to not let the absence of possible metrics deter you from doing important things. Because a lot of things that in fact can't be measured are really important for foundations to do. Uh, policy engagement, advocacy. Uh, uh, advocacy I think is, uh, is tricky, but I think for the reasons that I said earlier, the donors who can afford to get, in, get involved in advocacy should do it. 
um, that, and that foundations can, can do some can, can, carefully advocacy. Advocacy is an important thing because it, it does really, especially if most of the advocacy that we're thinking of when we use the word advocacy involves in trying to persuade the, the governments to do something themselves because these problems that foundations are working with can't be solved by the foundations. They, they're good to prime solutions to develop, to develop new ways of trying to deal with the problems, but they can't actually solve the problem. For, for any big problem to be solved, it requires public support. And that really means using advocacy to, as, a, as a kind of leverage to, get, to, to bring to bear in getting governments to do what you'd like it to do. Collaboration. Collaboration is, a, uh, is an, as somebody wrote me, as somebody has said publicly, collaboration among foundations is an unnatural act. Uh, that, that, is, that the, the truth of the matter is that foundations do not easily collaborate. And if you, if, you are, if you are catalyzing collaboration among foundations here at the center, God bless you and I wish you success. It, uh, you can, it, it's just hard, it's very hard to do, which is why that, the, the, the grand bargain in Detroit was so exceptional because it did in fact got, got I think 17, ultimately 17 foundations to collaborate. They put up hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and, they, and they're all very proud of what they've done, but nobody wants to do it again, as far as I can tell. <laughs> it's not a, a model for the future. <laughs> no. They're very clear about that. Um, impact investing. Well, impact investing um, uh, is a, a controverted subject because, and more foundations have declared an, a, a, an aspirational goal of spending part of, putting part of their endowment into impact investing, emission investing, whatever you want to call it, than have actually gotten there. Because it's very hard to do. The professionals who, who run, who are the chief investment officers of foundations are not comfortable with it, by and large, as a general rule, because in fact, it makes it much more complicated to figure out how much money they're, they, they, how much money they're going to, they need to earn in order to pay the, the, uh, the, the grant fees and the running costs of the foundation because you know, once you once you begin doing the impact investing, it's likely to, the, the results are going to take are going to be slower to achieve. And so, how do you figure out day, year to year uh, what things you invest in in order to generate the, the the monies required to pay the grants and the running costs of the foundation? So it's been very very slow. I mean, you, you, but it it's picked up in the sense that the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, did say that he was aspiring to put uh, ten percent of its of their, Ford's assets into impact investing. Um, but he, they, they, I think, I don't, I'm not sure that they've even started, but in any event, he set a two or three year goal. The Heron Foundation, which, which is the one that actually first said that it was gonna put all of its assets into, into impact investing, um, uh, it, they said that four years ago, uh, but even they said that we won't get there for three or four years, and the president who was at the foundation at that point when they declared it is no longer there. So, but in any event, the, and, uh, and the, the, the um, uh, uh, what's Rick Raffson's foundation? The Kresge, Kresge. Foundation uh, has also decided it would put 10% in. So a number of foundations, small number, but a discrete number of foundations have in fact decided to do impact investing, but it's complicated. It's complicated, it complicates the investment formula. And therefore, my sense is it's a good idea. In principle, it makes sense the foundations that want to achieve impact to, to put part of their endowment, in some cases, all of their endowment. It was the, what's the foundation that, that, that just announced it? Uh, Cummings. The, the Cummings, the, that's right, the Cummings, Nathan Cummings Foundation decided it was gonna put all of its money into impact investing. So the long and the short of it is, uh, it's a good idea, but it's got to be done carefully if it's gonna succeed. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, any questions for Joel? Well, you say you can advocate policy if you pay your executive out of personal funds rather than foundation funds. But then when you advocate, do you, the, the money used for advocation is also personal funds or that comes out of the foundation as well? No, no, it, you can't use the foundation, well, Advocacy by foundations is tricky because of that very reason, in a sense that you can, if you, if you get a request from a member of Congress or a congressional committee to express the view, your, your, the, the foundation's view, you can actually do it. It's one of, one of the four exceptions to the non-advocacy rule for private foundations. 
You can, you can in fact, respond to it. But on your own, if you do anything relating to legislation, it's got to be, uh, it's, got to ha it's got to have all sides, to, or both sides to, to an issue. So it, it, is, it is not easy to deploy any tax benefited dollars from foundations in actually engage, implementing advocacy. The, the advantage of, the, of, the, of not paying the, the chief executive of a foundation from the foundation is, that it, uh, at least I was surprised that the IRS let it go, frankly. But they did, but they did let it go. They've not, they've not done anything about it, and, the, and it continues to be a practice of several foundations that, that where, you, where you pay the, the, found, the salary from the, the non-tax benefited dollars, the, uh, the, uh, after tax dollars of the, of the, of the donor. Uh, so you can, you, can, you can in fact lobby if, if that's the case, but you can't deploy any of the foundation's resources in actually engaging in the advocacy. I was interested in the philanthropy in other countries than the United States. Uh, Europe, Asia, right. which, which other countries are following the United States uh, in this regard and which ones aren't? And if you have reasons why that's the case. Well, the answer is that, that, that other countries are beginning uh, to have wealthy individuals who want to put their money into foundations. If you look at the, at the signatories of the Buffett Gates pledge, it was all Americans at the beginning but it then gradually began to acquire uh, other nationals. Um, Carlos Slim is a good example, the Mexican um, uh, industri industrialist who, in mobile phones and I think other things as well, who for, for a while said he wasn't gonna give any money to charity at all, that he felt that his major contributions to society were, were the business that he created and the jobs that he created, as a matter of fact. Makes sense. Big, big chunk of the of GDP in all cases. But he then, when the, when the, when the Buffett Gates pledge was created and announced, he did join, ultimately, and he is now giving away a lot of money. You look at the, um, uh, the it, both, in, both in India and in China, uh, we've been entertaining a group, this is something you should do too, actually, the, en entertaining a group of, of Chinese billionaires, who there are a number of them who are now interested enough in wanting to come to the United States uh, and, and meet with people in foundations and wealthy families to get some sense of how they go about it. We've been, in, we've been doing it now for, I think, three years, uh, and we've organized tours for them, starting at Duke, going to New York and meeting with some of the, the, uh, the, the longtime philanthropic families there, and then going to Seattle and meeting with the Gates Foundation there and some of, their, and the, people, some of the members of the Gates family there. But they, they are, you know, and uh, Duke has an interest, obviously, in this, in the, in the sense that Duke has created the Duke Kunshan University uh, in Kunshan, China. <laughs> and so uh, they are, they've been particularly interested in, in getting to know the families of wealth in China who might be interested in it. So the long and the short of it is, India, China are, have, have growing groups of people uh, who who are uh, interested in China. If you, maybe you may have read the article in the, I think it was in The Economist, which described the problems that the Tata family, family was having with respect to the structuring of its, found, its, its philanthropy. It turns out that most of Tata Industries, I didn't realize this, most of Tata Industries is, is owned by, their, by a charity, by foundations that they created, basically. And so you've, this is one of the largest industries in India, uh, and, and it's worldwide, uh, and they, they, at one point, someone from the, from, the fat, from the foundation called me up and said he wanted to talk about philanthropy, but I never heard from him again. I don't know whether, <laughs> so I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't pursued him, however, but, but, but in, in any event, uh, there are the, the European, um, the European countries um, have grown a number of foundations. After the Second World War, um, uh, Germany, for example, uh, passed laws that, that enabled them, the wealthy individuals, to do what um, uh, they, the, the same thing that, ultimate, that American foundations tried to do and then got prevented from doing, which was having businesses owned by foundations. 
under the Tax Act of 1969, can't, you can't do that. A foundation cannot own more than a, a, a stipulated interest. I think it's 20% of, 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 of an operating business. That's not true in, in Germany. In Germany, take the Bertelsmann Foundation, which is one of the large media organizations in the world. Bertelsmann Foundation owns the Bertelsmann Company. 90, 93% of the stock in the Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann Company is owned by the, by the foundation, essentially. The problem with that is when they did it, they didn't stipulate any minimum payout. So un, US foundations have to pay out 5% of the value of their assets on a five-year rolling average um, in order to satisfy the requirements of the, of, of the Internal Revenue Code. In Germany, there is no such stipulate minimum payout. So you get the anomaly of the, if, if the Bertelsmann Foundation were based in the United States, the, the, the assets of the foundation are somewhere in the 25 to $30 billion at this point, they would have to pay 5% of that, right, every year. There's no minimum. And so the, if you look at how much the Bertelsmann Foundation is putting into, is, is getting from the Bertelsmann Company, it's maybe $100 million which is nothing compared to the billions of dollars that they could have got. So the public really did not get a very good deal in the German law, but the fact is that some 200 companies in Germany own, own, are owned by foundations. Uh, so you get, that's, that dates to the, you know, right after the, after the Second World War. Uh, and the, 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 you know, France is another, pro, is another problem because under the, under, the, under the tax laws in France, you, you have to have a member of the government on the board of the foundation. Those of you who are foundations, wonder, I wonder how you would feel about that. <laughs> uh, and if you, look at the, if you look at the foundation sector in France, you will understand why it's moribund for all practical purposes because they, they do good things, that, like all foundations, but they, but they stay away from more things than they do because of the fact that the, that the government is actually on the foundation board representing it. Uh, it's, it's so, so the answer is you get, you're getting different permutations of the way in which philanthropy is dealt with, but, the, but as, a, as, a, as a worldwide rule with respect to the developed world countries, we're seeing more, much more philanthropy. There are even, even a couple of Scot, Scottish um, um, uh, billionaires who signed the, 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 the Gates Buffett pledge. I mean, so the Scottish are not as thrifty as one might have think in principle. Uh, speaking of tax law, and uh, it may be too early to tell, but any reflections on the impact of philanthropy and what just went into this new tax law? Uh, which, which, the, the new tax law? Oh, the and, tax law. Yeah, three. Uh, the, 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 it, there, there is a divergence of opinion about it. The reports that have come out uh, from reputable sources, like the uh, Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute just recently, predicted that there would be a uh, that, that because of the doubling of the standard deduction, there, there was likely to be some drop off, a minor drop off in the amount of individual giving. Um, that people would opt to take the standard deduction rather than to make tax deductible contributions to organizations. But it, we were talking, the figures that they used were something like four or five percent at maximum. I don't, and there are others who believe that, the, that it's not going to have any significant effect because if you look at the, the way in which the, the, the total amount of money given away to charitable organizations uh, in, 19, in 2016 from all sources, foundations, corporations, uh, giving by individuals at, during life and, and, um, and bequests was $400 billion. Uh, of that $400 billion, $300, billion, uh, 300 of the billion was by individuals in life. 80% of the 300 billion was taken as a tax deduction uh, by, by the donors. And so you, you, you have to ask yourself the question, these were large gifts. So why would somebody want to take the standard deduction um, uh, if he had large gifts to give? And, and we know that the 80% the 80, 80 of the dollars coming from private individuals is in fact going all, it was used to take deductions. Um, so I, I, it doesn't, compute right for me, but, I, but th th this is, we'll see what happens. My guess is that, that th there, it, there could be a small decline. I don't think it'll be a big decline uh, in, in giving as a result of it, but um, uh, it's potentially a problem. I mean, you know, who would have thought that Congress would pass a law uh, uh, putting a, a, a tax on the endowments of, uh, of private institutions, depending on the number of, uh, of disadvantaged students who are enrolled in the, in the institution. 
Um, uh, that was a, a big surprise, I think, to our to people in universities and, and, and people who observe the sector. So it's hard to know what, 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 what Congress will do under these circumstances when you've created, because of the spending, um, the kind of debt, uh, annual debt, uh, pre, pre, or I don't know what the total, it, 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 it's, it's, in the, it's in the trillions. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's very scary. And who knows what Congress might do as a consequence of that. Yeah. A couple of things. One is that the, the big effect of the change in the tax law might be the distribution of giving across different types of nonprofits and fields of interest. Um, the other thing is, Joel mentions sort of the excise tax on endowments. There's also a tax on, on organizations that pay their employees more than a million dollars. So there are a couple of little pieces that were on somebody's agenda <laughs> for right. the tax reform right. bill. Uh, one last question, and then I'll end with one myself. Uh, there's uh, both with uh, you know, federal government funding a lot of pressure on public policy schools. What kind of impact have you had this year? Uh, and it often takes a lot of time. My question has to do with when you ha have a professional staff uh, that is built up over time, uh, in what, w how do they get evaluated in terms of their performance? My limited experience suggests that they don't want to fail uh, because they want to show successes and if that's the case, uh, do you think that has maybe a, a negative effect on creativity or, or innovation or the ability to solve some of these issues over yeah. time? Well, I think the short answer to that question is yes. That, that the, 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 when I was at Atlantic, we did 360 evaluations of the, the, the evaluating the performance of the, of the program staff individually. Um, from all perspectives, uh, uh, we, and we established targets um, and tried to make some judgments about the achievement of those targets by the program officer. But the important thing was to get the get get the people, both the people who supervised and the people who were supervised by those um, uh, those uh, pro the program officers to to talk about them. Um, the the if you. I'm a longtime critic of foundations for their lack of uh, transparency, that they do not readily talk about their mistakes. Uh, and, and indeed, they not only do not talk regularly about, about their mistakes, they do not give you, when they, when they pridefully talk about the things that they've accomplished, it's like pulling teeth to get them to tell you how they accomplished them, in the sense that giving, giving you the, the blueprints of what they've done, uh, which is basically frustrates the foundations if there's if they, they one of the missions of foundations is to pioneer new new, new initiatives and if they don't tell you how the new initiatives worked uh, how can the world anybody replicate them for all practical purposes it's a problem uh, and it's one that foundations we, we, we used to have problems when we would collaborate going back to collaboration with two or three other foundations and every foundation we were always willing to share the the evaluative doc, documents uh, if we commissioned evaluations of, of, a, of, a, of a grant that we all three had made, we were willing to share the evaluations that we commissioned. The other foundations wouldn't even let us see the, 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 the evaluations that they had commissioned. Um, so there's a lot of self-protection going on in foundations. That, and it's something that the managers of foundations need to worry about uh, because th that kind of uh, atmosphere, the, the, the lack, a lack of, tr uh, of of uh, transparency is is paralyzing for all practical purposes, uh, and it's uh, uh, it's unfortunate. But the point you make is a very good point, and the, the best foundations try to emulate what the best businesses do with respect to evaluating the performance of them, and they set up targets for for them, uh, and 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 it works reasonably well. It's not perfect. So I'm going to sort of move that up to the boardroom. Uh, okay. The question. And basically, in the case of the grand bargain, the, the foundations in Detroit that came together, they mostly gave outside of their guidelines <laughs> and everything they've done in the past. Um, but it was a partnership between the board and the CEO that enabled those foundations to act boldly. Right. It's not really 
well, it starts at the top of the organization. So can you reflect upon how well are foundations governed in the US um, since they're really not subject to uh, market forces right. or political forces? Um, how do you achieve excellence in, in the foundation? Foundation boards evolve. I mean, if you look at the, the, the typical foundation board going back when foundations were, st were started, Andrew Carnegie put his lawyer on the board. He put his, you know, he put his lawyer on the board. And when the lawyer uh, aged out, he put his lawyer's son on the board, uh, who was another lawyer, uh, Elihu Root. Uh, but, um, uh, and he had put his accountant on the board. And, and he put his secretary on the board for all practical purposes. The boards have, but if you look at the Carnegie Corporation of New York now, you, the, the, none of those people there, there none of them around, and it's really a, a professional public board for all practical purposes. Uh, the, but boards are really peculiar. Every, I, 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 was it something? It's, when you've seen one foundation board, uh, that's all you've seen one foundation board. It's not, it's, it, it is, and they, they differ. Uh, some foundation boards really work amazingly well together in pioneering new ideas because they keep the pressure on and they get and to, to get to develop new ideas. Other foundation boards uh, become like little baronies of, uh, of, uh, of individual trustees. This was a problem, I, 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 it was um, when the, this is not related to the current or even the immediate past of uh, 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 board of uh, board of the Rock uh, of the um, of the Rockefeller Foundation, but that's two. There are three searches ago. The, the, the headhunter came to me and said, um, uh, "What ideas do you have for somebody to, to lead the Rockefeller Foundation?" And I, I said to him, "Well, um, what do the what do you you've, you've interviewed all the members of the board? What what do they tell you that they're looking for in the presidency of the Rockefeller Foundation?" He, he laughed. He said, "Joel," he said. I've interviewed every member of the board, and every member of the board has a different view of what they're looking for in the, in the, in the, in the search for a new president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation you know, has, had, has, has had its problems, in a sense. Uh, it is, it, it, in its early years, um, there were really, there, I think it, there were several, I think John D. Rockefeller, never, senior, never served on the board. Junior did serve on the board briefly. Uh, Jay Rockefeller served on the board briefly. Um, and um, David Rockefeller had not served on the board at all, but his sister had served on the board, the Rockefeller Band. She came on the board to celebrate basically the 100th anniversary of the foundation. And was, it was a great thing to have him there do it, but he's now off the board again. So the problem with, with, with some foundations is that they, there's the, the lack of having some figure on the board with the moral authority to get things done and the, having a, a founder on the board while the founder's alive is a good thing for the most part. Having founder's children on the board can also be a good thing. And, and it looks like that the Rockefeller Foundation is sort of moving back in that direction. The problem is that, 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 that the boards have to be built. They're, entered, they're living entities for all practical purposes. And you need to build a living entity uh, in, that can work together and do all the things that need to be done without having an axe to grind of some, of some kind personally. That's a hard thing to achieve. Uh, you know, if you read, the, if you read the, the chapter in the book about the, about the Ford Foundation, um, Henry Ford bemoaned the fact, that Henry Ford II bemoaned the fact that it, the board had become so diverse that he really couldn't control it to the extent that he would like to control it. But on the other hand, he was praising the board for all the wonderful things they were doing. And uh, you know, the, the, th the two things sort of con uh, conflict with one another. Uh, he, he knew enough about creating a dynamic board that could come up with interest. The Ford Foundation's record is a pretty good record by any foundation standards in terms of the things that they were doing, uh, particularly dealing with social policy of one, of one sort or another. And so, and, and even Henry Ford agreed with that, but he's kind of resented the fact that he didn't really have the same kind of instant control over the board that he would have had if, if he had picked his friends and, uh, to be on the board. It's, complicated. it's a complicated question, uh, a complicated answer. Um, 
the, ba the, the big foundation boards, uh, you know, you look at the Hewlett Foundation Board, which is required to have certain member, certain number of members of the family on the board. Um, they have a wonderful system of, 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 of training their, the members of their board. They've created a smaller foundation called the Flora Fund, which every member of every descendant of, um, of William and Flora Hewlett sits on that sits in, can be on that board. But the board then they just, then they help then they judge the the, the members of that board uh, on the basis of the contribution that they've made in terms of expertise and dedication and everything, and the ones that do the best job get elected to the board of the big Hewlett Foundation. We're talking ma magnitudes of, si of size. The small foundation may have a couple hundred million dollars. The big foundation has nearly twelve billion dollars, uh, and so they've and and so they built in. And the same thing is true about the Packard Foundation. So there are the ways families that want to create perpetual foundations can in fact help build the dynamism of those organizations by, by, by what they specify. Uh, but you, family, the donors who create perpetual foundations who don't have any children are in a different situation. How do you get the same kind of moral authority on the board uh, that, you, that you need to create the cohesion there? It takes really strong leadership and wisdom in trying to figure out how to put those boards together. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long series of the answer to a question, but it's a very perceptive question. So effective boards are hard work. Effective boards are very hard work. That's exactly But right. important. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me conclude by thanking you, Joel, um, for joining, putting us on your dance card this time around. Uh, he's traveling all over, um, and um, sort of sharing your knowledge and insights. It's, it's really refreshing to have someone that has the long view of where philanthropy is going. Um, thank you, Jane and Michael, Trent, the Eisner Foundation for hosting today, and for the Jewish Community Foundation and Goldman Sachs as well. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, there are copies of the book, um, so you can see how uh, true the conversation today was to the writings of Joel Fleischman. And I have, uh, I've already autographed the books. So, uh, so make, they're pre-signed <laughs> and I did it. No machine, not, not a machine. <laughs> and he says that his autograph got better over time. It's amazing. So. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to improve the way you sign your checks or letters or anything else, try Try, try autographing several thousand books. <laughs> it, and, and, and it really has improved my handwriting. But I want, I, before we close, I want to, I want to echo my thanks to, my, to Michael and Jane and to Tramp Stamp the Foundation and the other co-sponsors of this, of this event. It's wonderful to see y'all here and it's wonderful to have a chance to meet some of you. And I hope that this has been somewhat beneficial to you and, and that if you have any questions, you can always email me. Uh, but in any event, thank you all very, very much for coming and thank for, you. For, for.